to start to hear each other's stories here as a community. Um, Page Cooch is a format about fast paced presentations and, and sharing stories. And I think this is a really great way because we've got all these amazing people from uh, close to 80 different countries already on the platform. And we really want to facilitate you guys learning from one another. Um, so I'm really excited to hear each of your stories. Cool. So the first, our first member we'd like to, to share is Thomas coming in from South Africa. He has a really excellent, really cool story I'd like to share on something called duplex soils. Now, this is going to be really fun to hear about. Uh, so Thomas, I'm going to set a seven and a half minute timer here. And I'll just let you know about a minute and a half before, before it's done. So okay. cool, you're set for seven and a half minutes and when we click play, we'll get started. All right, let's go for it. Thomas, um, you're all good to present. Great, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, as a quick context, I guess we're in the heart of South Africa, about uh, four hours south of uh, Johannesburg, as the crow flies about 350 k's from the Indian Ocean. We're an NGO and we've started to rent the land that we're on uh, in 2015 to just um, create a, 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 best, a, a case study on how we could work on these duplex soils. Uh, we're in a mountainous area about 1700 meters above sea level. Our rainfalls in the, um, in the summertime, uh, it's about 564 millimeters as a, uh, an average, long-term average, so rather dry. Um, and we're close to the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. And we were lacking enough to raise enough funding uh, last year to buy the farm by foot, which we are very happy about. Um, so what are duplex soils? Well, very simply, I guess, uh, they're, they're shallow, sandy, loamy topsoil uh, and a very heavy clay horizon below. So when it rains, the water penetrates very easily into the, into the A horizon, gets stopped at the clay layer, and then starts running along with, with the gravity. With this, the water takes along all the loose grains of topsoil and some of the clay. As this is a dispersive clay, and we'll see that a little bit later still what that, what that means, really. Um, and that creates tunneling, and these tunnels eventually collapse, and um, this starts these uh, incredible, um, spectacular erosions here. They are like eight, nine meters deep, and you can see here nicely the, um, the, the, set, the, the thin top uh, soil layer, and then the, 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 the B horizon right down uh, the bottom. Um, again, a couple of soil pits that we did, the top left uh, picture you see, there's no more topsoil left and this is the type of clay that uh, sits there uh, where there's nice vegetation on the right hand side here, you can see um, uh, it's nicely held by, by plants and uh, no, no erosion whatsoever. Um, many of the uh, uh, the, the soil scientists all around the world, they obviously say don't do anything with duplex soils, uh, so don't do any tilling, don't uh, just leave it, um, uh, because uh, yeah, it is just a, a notoriously difficult soil to, to work with. Um, we did take uh, um, extensive soil tests and they all showed that um, there is a fairly good agricultural potential. Um, so we thought, well, uh, we'll give it a try. But of course, um, everybody tells us that we should do as little as possible on those soils. Um, when we start cultivating this piping uh, as starts happening and the erosion, we try to do some erosion, uh, um, fighting some of the erosion here on the, just with vegetation, with uh, stone barriers, with, uh, um, even wet over grass and, and still the, the, the clay just uh, went through like uh, pudding. Um, 
So the best is, of course, to work with biology rather than with technology. So re-establish uh, deep rooting grasses and stitch together soil with uh, 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 clay-loving shrubs and, and trees. Um, but of course, we wanted to uh, harvest a lot of the, the rainwater that falls because we have so little. Um, and, uh, and, the, and we wanted to do that at the bottom end of our land, which is more flat. It's about 40 hectares. The mountainous areas are more uh, pristine still. Um, so yes, um, what do we do? We wanted to do um, uh, swales and dams uh, in this. Um, so we've had quite a lot of experience all over Southern Africa um, with swales in Namibia, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. Um, we did, did a lot in different environments. Um, so yeah, I was lucky enough to go uh, 2015 uh, do an earthworks course with Jeff Lawton in Australia, which was absolutely fantastic. So when we got home, we took out our um, surveying equipment and the big machines and off we went with uh, along the contours, um, which was quite fantastic to see uh, what all uh, it was uh, discovered, I guess, under the grass layer. Um, did, and we decided to go below um, the clay layer, about a foot uh, into the clay layer, so that we don't get this tunneling happening um, through uh, um, the, the water that uh, dams up behind it. We then, of course, uh, vegetated it with quick growing um, uh, plants, uh, cowpeas, um, uh, Saint Foin, clovers, vetches, and so on. Um, and yeah, we've uh, even though we were in a drought, we got uh, beautiful uh, first rains, and uh, that helped to vegetate those swales, and uh, uh, provided good fodder in the winter time. The top right, you can see the the, the grassland at the back is yellow, uh, so uh, that is a deep winter where we have six months no rain. Um, but of course, we also wanted uh, uh, dam sites. So our test pits uh, uh, brought about very nice, uh, good clay that we could uh, build a, a great dam walls uh, with a good key in between. And, uh, and slowly those filled up. It took about two and a half years for this uh, dam to fill up. This is a four and a half million liter dam. Um, and now you can see really what it means uh, to have dispersive clays. Uh, this is chocolate pudding water that just stays there for um, forever. It just is in suspension and doesn't uh, flocculate out. Uh, eventually, because uh, Hugh Lovell uh, recommended that we use gypsum on our land, I had uh, an idea of just throwing it into the water and I put about one and a half tons into this water and voila, uh, now we have a beautifully clear um, a dam. So obviously, um, it, there's a there was a change on a on a molecular ele electronic molecular level, and that flocculated that clay out, and it's uh, quite f uh, fascinating, fas uh, fantastic to have. So uh, here we see what we've put in. Uh, this almost one and a half kilometers of swales coming into uh, two dams, um, one four and a half thousand liter, uh, uh, four and a half thousand kiloliter dam, one, one and a half thousand kiloliter dam. So um, a wonderful reservoir of water, both in the soil and uh, in, in, um, in dams and swales. Um, this is a beautiful, picture uh, that shows new growth and that is actually an erosion uh, area that was below a swale that the swale cut across um, on the right hand side uh, this is uh, the end of one of the swales that we let get out in uh, um, uh, overflow in, in, in a rocky area um, so this if you look at this left hand picture again with all this green grass it's really um, uh, below the, the top swale in an area that was before a huge um, uh, area 
and uh, minute, the swale me. has intercepted the water. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, slowed it down to such an extent that it didn't continue to, uh, to create erosions and let the, the grass uh, grow beautifully. So quick picture overview. This was before we came there, just as we've uh, built the, the swales. You can st still see a lot of the erosion. You see the contours, which are not really contours. Um, they are um, diversion drains, basically, and that's, this is a pretty recent picture in the winter time. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, these earthworks have given us lots of joy and uh, animals, um, uh, beautiful niches, and yeah, even our ducks uh, enjoy a, um, a skate, skating on the ice in the winter time occasionally. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome story, yeah, awesome nice, work. Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for sharing. And thank you, Thomas and Kath, for both joining us in, in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, really yeah. appreciate you guys taking the extra energy to be part here. No, it's a pleasure, thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. Good seeing those earthworks heal in the soil. That's fantastic. So our next presenter is Kath. And uh, quick switch up. We're going to give folks like an extra minute in the presentations because we had, uh, I think, one panelist drop, which gives us a bit of extra time. So we're just going to let you guys know now instead of seven and a half minutes, it's going to be eight and a half minutes. So a little bit more flexibility here. And I'll do that same thing for each of the speakers where cool. I just chime in. And, and Thomas, you got that extra period as well, so you don't feel left out, just so you know. Um, also, as people ask questions, please, in your, in your, if your questions are for a specific panelist, say for and then the panelist name so that when we get to the end, when we're doing the question. Okay. All right. So next up is going to be Kath. She's coming in from Australia and it's what? 3 a.m. over there, 4 a.m.? Oh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's only 4.15 in the morning now. Yeah, it's only 4.15. Yeah, geez. She up by two. <laughs> all right, well, we'll get to yours. I really appreciate you sticking in here. Join us all the way. Uh, what, what area of Australia are you coming from? Okay, that's good. That'll save me a bit of time in my talk. So um, <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, wow, Thomas did such an awesome job of like setting the scene for yourself whereas I, I've kind of launched in and you're not going to know what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm in Victoria uh, which is uh, to the uh, south east of the Australia and there there is a nice. map that you'll see later but um, okay oh am I starting have you started my timer? Well yeah we can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready just give oh, us a okay all right give us a go. Okay so first of all, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Jajarung country um, and that I acknowledge the elders of this country. That's something that we do in Australia and it's um, becoming more and more common. I'd spent yesterday working with the elder of this land, running his first tour, which uh, blew everyone away. So I'm incredibly proud to have been involved with that. Okay, so the first invaders that came to this country um, found awesome soil, which was that slide you just saw, um, which um, is hopefully what we're trying to get back to this country. Here we've got um, Reuben, who was a willing worker on the land that I share with my 10 neighbors. He's trying to dig a hole and you can see that incredibly dry soil there. We, um, when the invaders came, they brought a whole lot of uh, bullocks with them that disturbed the soil and they found gold. So there was a massive gold rush in this part of Australia, in central Victoria. Uh, that gold rush decimated this land. Basically, they, they chopped all the big old trees down and used them to build their mines. And they blasted the topsoil with a process called hydraulic sluicing. They blasted all the topsoil down the hills into the creeks. So the land that I'm living on has none of the topsoil that would have been there originally. It's trying to grow its own. So uh, 
that's Reuben digging a hole into that incredibly dry soil. Um, if you go to the next slide, we've got, um, this is my township, basically. It's not my community. I live on an intentional community nearby, but we basically have a few hundred people living in our town. This is a Christmas party that our fire brigade ran that I'm a member of. Um, and in the gold rush, there were 16,000 people in this area. Called, it's called Friars Town, which nobody's ever heard of now, but it produced some awesome uh, gold and consequently the land really suffered. When, they, when the gold miners left, they uh, were followed by sheep. And then when the sheep left, there was another clear felling of the land. So if we go to the next slide, um, there basically are no uh, trees really in this. There's a few trees in the area that are over about 50 years old, but most of the trees are stumps, as you can see here, that are being looked in by my Tangarong friend and my partner, Stuart, with who has the dog and the beard, the white beard. And they're looking down in one of the very rare uh, relics of the old forest that was around here. So the area I live in is called Friars Forest. So I often feel the grief of the Jajarung, how that must have been to watch these trees go, because they were their ancestors. They had stories about them, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old. We've got a, there's a 600 year old tree in town that obviously predates the invasion of Australia, which was around about 250 years ago. So there's no trees standing on our property that are over about 50 or 60 years old. Um, if we go to the next slide, I moved from the city um, to live in this community. So I came from the coast into central Victoria. This is a very early meeting and you can see the trees on the property are predominantly, they're, they're tall, but they're very thin. They're young eucalypt, it's a eucalypt forest. Um, it's called Friars Forest Echo Community. I came with my young family. If we go to the next slide, and we built this house with our co-neighbours. Um, kind of looks a bit like an Austrian ski lodge. That's because he was Austrian and Stuart and I are filmmakers. So we kind of went with the Austrian guy who knew how to build. So we ended up with an Austrian ski lodge. That's my son Spike jumping on a um, trampoline in front of the house. There's some olive trees in the foreground there. So we've actually been, by this time, We've been on the land probably for about five years, I reckon, because those olive trees are starting to, starting to age. So we brought up our kids together. If we go to the next slide, and kids learn how to play together. They have their arguments and they make up and they work it all out. Whereas us grown-ups found it a lot harder. So you've got a community group of people and, you know, we just, yeah, we didn't realise the challenge we were in for with, in terms of negotiating the interrelationships. Um, and, you know, we're sharing our land, we're sharing our homes, and we're sharing bringing up our kids. It brought a lot of challenges. If we just go to the next map, the original inhabitants of this, uh, sorry, the next slide, yeah. The original inhabitants of this land, all those different colours are the language groups of the original people of Australia. So we're talking hundreds and hundreds of different language groups. These people had an awesome um, system for managing those complex relationships. And the English invaders sort of didn't really have any idea and these people were you know it's beautiful country they just wanted to take over the country they're coming from you know pretty sad kind of set up in England so they just kind of went for it and pushed these people around and we're talking about languages that are completely different to one another in this country very few of those languages remain but in, in the central Australia there's Walpi country which is um, where a fella I've spent a lot of time with and he's taught me a lot about how to live on this country. Um, so when we were fighting the original developers of my community, yeah, you can probably go to the next one. It's a kind of a random photo, but uh, the original developers of this country, of Fry's Forest Echo community, they split up and uh, relationships split up and there was a real kind of us and them thing happening. This is Denise, I've known her for 35 years. She's holding my daughter who's a couple of hours old there, I reckon. 
Um, she's now 16 and Denise and I now don't talk to each other and it really deeply saddens me. She was got cross because I got the second dog. We were supposed to be a one dog household and you know that really threw her and I'm not going to part with my second dog because it's blind and you know it's a total cutie pie and I can't figure out why I have to but it means that our relationship is no longer a rich one that it was and it deeply saddens me. We go to the next image the original uh, inhabitants of Australia had you know this is a skin system for the Walbury people in the central of, center of Australia that I mentioned I've learned from incredibly complex way of um, relating to one another and that reminds me of the complexity of the soil that li that I live on the incredible way that the soil dis distributes the nutrients around it I'm not a scientist at that um, you know, I look at this incredible, incredibly complex system that the Walpuri people had, which existed across Australia in all the different communities, all those different uh, language groups that you saw on that map. And it was incredibly complex. And it's just, yeah, it's designed to look after people. It's designed to make sure that everyone has enough. You lose someone, you risk the, you know, everyone's important because everyone holds part of that story and part of your survival really part of your history so One minute reminder yeah our community lives within a society that is yeah that has a, a a attitude of there's not enough so here's a tree stump which the eucalypts coppice regrowth you can see all that new growth on that tree and it's trying to survive in amongst um a clear felled forest okay we'll go to the next one so we come along and 25 years ago, we start trying to uh, figure out um, how to manage this forest. So you can see the very thin forest in the background. So we start trying to, we've done some thinning through there and we will do a little bit more. We're trying to vary that timber so that there is, uh, sun can get in. You've got some different ages of trees. We'll go to the next slide. You can probably just kind of go through them and I'll talk to them if you like, because I'm already over time. That's a slight, that's a swell created from the treetops. And here we are doing a bit of mulching of those swales. That's, uh, that's yep, no, keep going. You can see there's a swale there with some mulch um, created. We'll go to the next slide. And in the next slide, we're, um, I think we're doing some inoculating with a bit of mycelium to try to break it up as quickly as we can to rebuild that soil. And yeah, I guess, meanwhile, there are some greenhood orchids. Meanwhile, the forest is doing its own thing and it is managing, there is an incredible robust survival to Australian soils. Uh, okay, let's just go through the next and I'll wing it. I reckon I must be uh, getting way over time. Okay, so that is when my neighbour drove over his electric car and started a fire. So we live, and I think that's me putting the fire out in one of my yellow uniforms. So we live in an incredibly fire prone area and everyone's deeply worried. Keep going through all those slides. We must only be up to that. <coughs> what are we up to? Did yeah, let's okay, so wrap there are it up some of my neighbors. logically as you can. Yeah, looking super worried. So that's the drive. Yaram Mullawit is a bat that the Jajarung reckon help us to all get along. And here you can, yep, keep going. <laughs> and here is the uh, water that we're hoping to have flow. And that's the dam overflowing. So we are in amongst a whole lot of um, environmental impacts. That's a tree that died and that's a reminder that we have to care for and relate to and nurture the, the land that we live on and engage with it. If we don't engage with it, it doesn't live. Country needs, pe country needs people. And that is an example of a healthy looking landscape. Thank you. How many minutes was I? Oh, so you were, you were pretty close. You were uh, at 11, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, we I'm let you run on there. Yeah, Apologies. we, I mean, the, the aim is to keep things short, not to rush people. So, 
um, we can be a little flexible there. And and thanks for sharing. You know, I I see so much. I totally agree. There's so many areas where the land is abandoned and it is missing its people, and we can have a really positive impact with it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Kat. That was a beautiful story. Great story. So next up, we're going to have Nanette. She's also coming in from South Africa. Welcome, welcome. So Nanette, let me just oh. Oh, Hi, everyone. Go. Awesome. Hey there. Um, OK, so just tell me when you're ready for me. Yeah, sounds good. Zach, let me know when the time Yeah, is. we are ready. I will start the timer whenever you start. All right, ready to rock okay. it, Nanette. Great stuff. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, the intended outcomes of this presentation is to give viewers an overview of this wetland area with the aim to restore and protect it, receive input from international and local water experts, providing an example to others who want to repair the water cycle in their community, and perhaps sparking a conversation about alternatives to including sewage in our water cycle. This is the Nortuk um, wetland area in the Nortuk Valley. It's flanked on the north, south, and east by mountains and hills. In, this, in the winter, it's a winter rainfall region, wind from the sea bringing rain to Nortuk. And then in summers, they're dry, dominated by the strong southeasterly, channeled through the, Nur channeled through the Fishhook Valley Gap towards Nortuk. Like elsewhere, the microclimate here is changing. Summers are becoming longer and drier and we experience far less rain. And when it does rain, it falls hard, short and fast instead of long, steady and slow. This low lying wetland is surrounded by higher lying residential areas, giving an amphitheater effect. When it rains, water flows below and above ground runoff from surrounding suburbs over asphalt and paving through stormwater drains which eventually also empty out into the basin. Lower down bordering the wetland are more residential areas, a commercial and industrial hub, and right in the middle of the wetland an upmarket residential estate containing an artificial lake which used to be a natural salt pan. A densely populated low cost informal settlement, a large chunk of which is on the wetland is also located alongside the so-called pick and pay reed beds, which contain three small ponds. The two Vildefuel flay pans, um, southwest of the sewage treatment works used to be seasonal, but are now full of water year round because treated effluent from this old and overburdened plant is released into them. Their overflow is channeled to the Nurtuk beach into one of two um, overflow lagoons. In periods of heavy rains, the pans and plates in the basin can become inundated and interconnected, eventually draining both through subsurface seepage and surface flow to the lagoons that also receive ocean water from storm waves during high spring tides. Popkills Flay, the portion of the wetland between Lake Michelle and the beach, is described in a 1999 report as the last remnant of the original seasonal wetlands of the Nurtuk Valley. This wetland, which has been drastically modified and encroached upon by rapid urban expansion, is one of the endangered western leopard toads breeding sites. The most recent development proposal is to build a road through one edge of the wetland, which local environmental groups have been fighting tooth and nail. Over and above the Western leopard toad, the fables unique to this area, as well as waterfowl and other life that used to be prolific are being pushed out by extensive hydrological and terrestrial transformation caused by never ending urban expansion and all that comes with it. There are currently no major water courses feeding this area. The valley floor, which is impermeable granite layer overlain by sand results in a high water table. Because of the interrelationship between the high water table and the mosaic of pans, flays, and marshland in this basin, from a management and conservation perspective, it means the bodies of water here cannot be considered in isolation from one another. I thought of how this area is potentially perfect demonstration of the small water cycle and how a community can work towards seeing visible results in water cycle restoration efforts. 
instead of continuing to allow the degradation caused by our mismanagement of the landscape and water resources. For example, what is the long-term impact on the water cycle of the increasing number of property owners in the amphitheater who are drilling boreholes on their properties to secure their own alternative water source? And what can be done design-wise in these suburbs to encourage aquifer recharge in situ? As Zach put it, our groundwater resources are like a bank. If we expect to benefit the benefit of withdrawal, what, um, that goes hand in hand with the responsibility of topping up. Also prior to the rapid expansion higher up, the seasonal hydrology of the wet and lower down supporting rich biodiversity was solely dictated by the tides and winter rainfall. Whereas now the state of the degraded wetland is the consequence of our unsustainable stormwater and sewage management plans. This report dating back to 1985 describes it as an extensive marshy area with numerous flays and pans, which were all interlinked in the past with many mountains feeding them. Today, many of these are no longer functional except during very wet seasons when the system still drains towards the Wildecourt Plain and its perennial outflow channel to sea. I find this area's microclimate of interest in that there are significant differences of temperature, wind erosion impacts, amount of precipitation, depending on exactly where you are in the small amphitheater, the topography playing an important role. Also, we are sometimes blessed with brief showers that never reach the other side of the mountain uh, where the big city of Cape Town is located. This time lapse of how the beach bordering the wetland has transformed calls for an illustrative comparison of how the adjacent wetland has changed. In South Africa, estuaries and wetlands are the most threatened yet least protected ecosystems. They form part of ecological infrastructure that is crucial for water security. They play an important role in water purification and buffering against, us, uh, against the effects of climate change. Due to human activity, microecosystem and species in these pressure hotspots are particularly at risk of collapse due to the accumulation of pressures. This particular wetland is an important ecological corridor within the southern district of Cape Town, which links the northern and southern part of the iconic peninsula mountain chain. There is an urgent need to address how we define these high value ecosystems in the regulatory framework that shapes our communities. Reports prepared especially for approval for future developments here refer to the current state of the land instead of acknowledging this state is the severely degraded and modified state of the wetland that needs restoration and preservation. There's a tendency, there's a tendency to speak of rehabilitation conditional upon development approval with the motivation that if the proposed development does not proceed, the environment will be left worse off when what is actually needed is to stop development in its tracks in highly sensitive ecological landscapes such as the, these, unable to tolerate further abuse. These were just some ideas I thought of. Um, last of all, we are a part of and not apart from this ecology. Through wise management practices, we have the ability to increase our positive instead of negative footprint. I hope that what we do in this special place will be work, a working example of what is possible to be done in the rest of the world. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Annette. Yeah, thank you for sharing. What a, what a, you know, heartbreaking transformation, but also awesome example of what's happening all around the world. And and hopefully we can really help guide you to some some meaningful parameters to really able to impact what's happening there. Yeah, I can tell it was, it was very well rehearsed. So thank you for putting the effort into it. I, it's it's so good seeing all these stories and all the, the effort and love that y'all are putting into it, into sharing sharing these. So where do you reckon, Paul? Are, are you feel like you're ready to present, or would you rather have Josh or or uh, Go go next, or one of us? How do you feel? Um, you can have somebody go before me. Okay. So you have somebody go before me, Ralph. You got it. So Josh, how do you feel? Would you like to present right now or, or Zach or I could go first? I, I can go now. Can you hear All me? right, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. So Josh, you can go ahead and share your screen. Zach will get a timer started and 
we'll we'll get you going. Yeah. What? Uh, all right. You can you you can see my screen? Not quite yet. Let me. Is, you okay. you click the share screen button below, and then that should allow you to share your screen. If not, you know, like I, I have your presentation, like, and I can just uh, present that if you want. Uh, okay. Why don't you Why don't you go ahead and do that? Cool. I'll go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm Joshua Rivagnes. Um, so the first image is a book. Yeah. Let me just open this up right now. All right. I'm just opening it right here. Cool. So okay. now you can see it, right? Um, so I read a book cool. about how to r read the book of nature and this was years ago. We didn't have problems with a lack of rain that I was aware of in the northeast corner of the United States of America. Um, I read this book and it gives instructions for communicating with nature's intelligence. Uh, Next slide, please. Whoops. Can you go back to, to the last one? I know it doesn't look like anything. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, so my landlady, who was blind, was better at this than I was. And when she read the Book of Nature, she had a vision of a pond in the backyard surrounded by hazelnut trees. I don't have a picture of the inside of her mind, but this is what it looks like, uh, I imagine, because uh, because she is blind. So you have to use your imagination. Um, OK, and then uh, you can go to the next one, please. Uh, so I didn't have any glee uh, material, any manure that I was able to get a hold of but I just tried to do what I could do. I dug a pit and I filled it up with the hose one day just to experience it. And I saw the sky reflected in the water. Um, and of course it drained out as anyone probably would expect. Um, but I just did what I could under the circumstances for the moment. Next one, please. Um, Okay, this is so strange. Um, so years later, um, my girlfriend read the book of nature and she, though she didn't know anything about Zupolzer's work with ponds, got very specific information that I should have three ponds of different depths and there should be piping among them to, um, she, didn't, she didn't know why they're, was supposed to be piping. She just described what she saw. There was also uh, a dragonfly and a crow. And this vision was one of the most beautiful things that I have seen. And it gave me energy to start going on this path of uh, land search. Um, next slide, please. At about that time, we moved and finally had a, a place where I could set up water catchment. And instead of the big brick building, we were renting a floor of a house. I, you know, this is just some random bucket that I found and uh, the water would mostly fall out of the drain pipe and fall into this thing. And there's a screen over it for bugs. Next one, please. Uh, but later I learned that it would be better to try to store the water in the landscape itself instead of in the, the buckets. I had to do all this piping because the way the house was built and designed was to shed water as fast as possible and put it into the sewage system. So there's plastic and stuff that I got for free. My budget was zero, but this is what I could do to direct that water over and get it to the soil. Next one, please. Um, we 
continued on this land search and for some reason we found many many places that had beaver ponds and I learned that beavers who aren't even human are able to do this incredible engineering. Uh, this isn't the best picture of one, but it is. it was built by, beaver, by beavers years ago. And um, in one of the ponds, uh, the farmers who owned that land, uh, they said that catfish fall out of it, just fall over the dam each spring without them even having to go fishing. Uh, they can just get catfish. Um, Next slide, please. I was becoming aware though that we're in a drought. Farmers have had to buy hay and it, it's worse this year than ever. So sometimes it would rain, I guess you can't see it in this picture, but it was just spit. And it wouldn't even be enough to congeal for the tension, surface tension to break and for the water to flow down into my water catchment system. So, I, I was becoming even more worried and I began to think we're beginning on the way to desert in New England. Next one, please. But I noticed that whenever it rained, even if it was only spit and the water catchment system didn't work, the plants still seemed to jump up in size. Uh, I don't have a scientific representation of this here, but this is just what it looked like after that squash plant or whatever, actually it's a volunteer, I don't know what it is, but the crew bit there, um, I swear it was like three quarters that size before the, that spit rain and then it became that size. Next one, please. Okay, and so I do sometimes read the book of nature okay, but not when I'm trying to get information about my garden, I still have a lot of blockage around that. But when I was asking about my health, uh, in a different way of working with nature, the, the nature team said the pond should go as far away from the water supply as possible on the other end of the yard. So the best I could do was to put a, a leaky bucket there. And so that's what this is. And then weirdly enough, the leak got stopped up. And so then the water just stayed there. Next one, please. Oh my goodness. Um, so Nature's doing something weird to my technology here. Um, so, uh, wow. Okay. Um, so I didn't know why I was feeling guided to give this presentation because I'm not an expert of any kind. I really don't know nearly as much as engineers and experts and stuff. However, um, I felt an intuition that I should do that. And when I took the picture that I just showed you before, I was suddenly reminded of a dream that I had years ago where I was shown very, 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 very vividly that I have an ability to know where these pots of water should be placed in a field, in what arrangement to support the growing of the crops in the field. I drew a picture of it, but you can't see it because for some reason, the technology has done a very weird thing with putting these other symbols here, um, which is just wild. And um, that's something that nature has often done is messed with my computer technology in interesting ways. And there's always some reason for it, even though I don't understand it. In this case, I really have no idea what this means. Hugh and Jay, and it looks like a smile. Um, but I guess that's probably supposed to be there instead of the, the three pots of water, which is what I was drawing. In the dream, they were three clay pots of water and there was a farmer putting them out in the field and I just knew that he was putting them in the wrong place. He didn't have the sensitization sensitization to that particular thing, but I did. And I, I, I knew that this was my job to put them in that particular place. That's the end of my presentation. And I, I hope I stuck with the time. And um, if I can do an, my extra minute, I do want to just try to explain something. Yeah, take your, you just got to the, go the reminder. So go ahead and take your extra minute. Thank you. So I, I did feel that this was important because Zepp Holzer says, read the book of nature. He doesn't see it, say, read the book of Zepp Holzer. And I think that our tendency is when we talk to other people, when we share these stories, we look to other human beings for answers. That's okay, but Zepp Holzer is saying, and Michelle Smallwright, who wrote that other book, that the, the person, that we, the being we have to actually go to is nature. And 
I, I guess it, it feels really important to me that we try to do that the best we can. As I think I made clear, I'm not that good. I don't consider myself good at it myself. It seems like everyone else around me has more ability to hear that than I do. But I still believe that it's really important because we really don't know what we're doing. We're in some pretty bad stuff here now at this point on our planet and we can't predict the future as well as we think we can. And Zepp Holzer started making a pond when he was seven. He was just playing and look what that has led to. I don't think we'd all be here today if he hadn't done that. And so being a kid and just making a bucket pond that seems to have no reason for it whatsoever might be the most important thing in the long run. I don't know. It might not be, but it might be. I just don't know. So that's my, my presentation that I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Josh. And I, I think that's really, you're really hitting on something that's really foundational to all of this and that it's so much easier to just copy what someone else is doing. Um, but in fact, so often that's not the right solution. It's not the best thing. And so much potential and possibilities come out of our imagination and intuition with nature. Um, and so if we always go back to that, different humans will make different innovations throughout time, always leading to a better common future instead of just trying to rinse and repeat and copy recipes and approaches that specific people developed. Yeah, and it just shows your journey about, you know, creating a relationship with nature, which I really appreciate. And like, I, I've been in the apartment for years and you're like, guys, I just need some need some connection to the land, like whether that's a French drain or a backyard compost, anything to get me started. And I think that's a thing that so many people want. So appreciate you telling that story. Uh, so Paul, would you like to go next or would you prefer Zach and I? Sure, I'll go. go. First. All right, let's do it. Let's hear from Paul, excited. excited All right. All right. Can everybody see that? Yeah, I can see you great. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is Paul Ladera, and uh, uh, I live right now currently in San Jose, a little bit south of Raleigh. And um, we have 37 acres in Browns Valley, California. That's about um, 60 miles north of Sacramento, state capital, 39 degrees latitude. Uh, 400 feet above sea level. Um, I think that's like 100 and, what is that, 121 meters, 150, I can't remember. Uh, and we get about 25 inches of rainfall a year. So uh, we have been, had been looking for land for a long time. I actually cook for a living and I had started to study ecology. Um, and farming probably 20 years ago. And I was fascinated. I met with some of the, these farmers that some of, that had started the organic movement. And I um, was really fascinated by the wildness of the whole thing and how they were just not concerned about where, what things grew where and, uh, and how amazing the food was. And so I started to get deeper and deeper into this this idea of, you know, what is it like to grow your own food? And then that led me down this path of completely rehabilitating landscapes and, and cultivating that wildness on a, on a larger scale. So um, this is a map of our property. Uh, if uh, the main thing to focus on here are ponds that are to the right, and then there's one in the middle on top of this hill, which actually has no water in it. Um, and the flow of water, you can see on the right where it's very green. Um, this was, this uh, drone photo was taken in the middle of summer. It was probably 100 degrees that day. So we have water moving underground here. And then these other green squigglies are um, potential sites for berms that uh, actually Zach and I had discussed a while ago. So staying in the center of the property on top of the hill, the next photo is actually a video. And that's just gonna take you across the top of the hill. And then there's a small um, 
little mountain. And if you look to the left, you see we have a five acre, that five acre pond is down at the bottom of the hill there. And this is probably uh, mid spring when this was taken. Uh, and then here at the very top of the hill um, in the middle of the map is the pond that I outlined uh, that will eventually hopefully become a natural swimming pool. And we would like to pump water up from the pond into this, into this pool and have it drain back down, filter it and drain back down. So we have about, well, at least 600 acres of watershed coming into our pond that we have existing on our property. Um, and their aeration issues to irrigate with, we want to have it be as clean as possible. And that's part of the plan. Although uh, uh, right, right now, and so here's the view of the pond. Uh, the first year we did uh, some uh, specialized grazing, regenerative grazing. Um, right now, we just got a notice from the California State Water Board that um, all water rights are going to be terminated for the rest of the year. So I would say that um, it's become increasingly clear. We've owned this property for four years about now. Uh, it's coming up, I think, on four years. And it's become increasingly clear that we need to have our own water infrastructure in place um, in order to care for the land in the way that we want and plant the things we want to have. Um, and thankfully, I've spent a lot of that time observing this property and not planting a lot of things because uh, number one, planting trees, um, a lot of trees at once is very expensive and I'm not there full time. Uh, and so given all the difficulties of that, I have erred on the side of caution and thankfully so now that you know we're not gonna have a bunch of water to irrigate with this year. So this is coming up to the very front of the property on the map on the right hand side, this is a view um, of this little house that is the original spring house where the, the um, uh, original homestead was uh, right near here. And there's still a spring there and this water flows underground from across the street. And if you just follow the green and the willows all the way down to the bottom in this drainage and that drainage goes through here um, where Buster is, just got done herding some cows and you can see the cows have been uh, eating away at the cattails. This is the second pond in the system. Um, and so we're trying to clear some of that out. We might put some pigs in there at some point, um, uh, but we can, we hope to rehabilitate this whole system so that we have a set of three or four ponds coming all the way down into this drainage. Um, where there would perhaps be another pond. And I think actually Zach, you had suggested maybe putting fish in here, which would be kind of cool. And um, we uh, are lucky in, to have water moving um, through the property. And, but also I think what's been interesting is to see how that happens in these soils because we have this um, sort of clay loam on top and then as you go down about um, maybe a meter, no, not even a meter, uh, you know, things start to get really rocky and you get this like shell sandstone mixture. Uh, and so when things get saturated, the, uh, the water just hits the rock layer and moves. So even now in the summertime, we can see it's very obvious, you know, where the wet spots are and that there's water moving underground all the way down. And this is, uh, you see all this um, juncus grass in here um, because it's so, it stays pretty wet in there. So we're getting water from, coming from the left here and then from this other direction um, towards, towards the tree on both sides actually. Um, and this is a, kind of the model that we're looking to um, work with on our property. This is a picture of the Deesa in Spain with the black-footed pigs. Um, 
tree cover, lots of oaks, um, shrub cover, kind of wild, kind of crazy, um, but it works very, very well, especially for raising animals. And so some of the ways I've started to try to do that is mimicking uh, um, how nature does things. And I've been just paying attention, watching over the years and seeing, and we have right next to this spot, this is a chestnut tree I planted in, on, in the blackberry so the cows can't get to it. I know no critters can get to it, but just um, above this spot, there's this couple of mulberry trees that have grown like, right out of these huge blackberry patches. And so eventually it dawned on me after a while, like, okay, well, if that's working, then why can't this, why can't I do that? And so one um, minute reminder, Paul. Thank you. So here's an example of um, I planted a, a little oak seedling on the bottom here, and I thought I was all proud of myself. And then I looked, if you look at the top of the photo, you see little pieces of green. Like, so nature already had that idea. <laughs> I was just following up on it. Um, this is the pond and bam, uh, we have beavers here very much and makes a lot of money and having to move this um, large amount of stuff every year because this is a uh, water needs to pass through um, especially with the winter rains. Here's uh, one of those critters that we captured on camera. Um, the one thing about the beaver dam is it's great habitat. So we see a bobcat passing. It's um, 9.16 p.m. Comes back exactly an hour later, fed. So I'm not sure what that is. I think it's a muskrat. Here's another view of the pond looking at the top of the hill where the video was. Um, we hope to build a house up there at some point. Um, this is the back 10 acres in the spring um, where we're managing uh, mainly blue oak, so Quercus de Glossy. Um, very, very drought tolerant. Um, it's still um, having, uh, some, some of the trees are having a tough time this year, especially. We're in a severe drought. Uh, this is part of the creek that comes down from the beaver dam. There's a little swimming hole here, so we're lucky to have that water pretty much year round still right now. And then the last is uh, just a shot of a video from that creek. Um, you can see we're not grazing as much back here yet. Um, this is a big mother tree, Douglas. Um, I mean, uh, blue oak. And it's in, that, in the spot that I planted those oak seedlings. And we come around to this bowl more blue oak and then right back to the creek just on behind those trees is where that waterfall is and just beyond those trees is where the main pond is. Um, so we are, you know, we're sp I'm spending probably uh, the majority of my time still observing things and thinking about before I you know, go get big equipment, like how I want things to be. Um, but uh, we are getting very close to, to um, starting to do some work. And I, I think for us in Northern California, this would be a great place to have people come and, and help and do some of that work and see that work on a large scale um, as we um, move forward with this project. So thanks everyone for, for having me. That's fantastic, thank you. Yeah, awesome to see what you guys have been up to since, since I was last there. Not too I've much, but just enough. <laughs> I've never seen a beaver in California and just think that you got one in your backyard. Just <laughs> yeah, one there with his own dam. That's that's amazing. It's magical. <laughs> Appreciate sharing. Um, awesome. So all right, so we can we can do co next or Zach or I could go. Well, let me try to fire up your, let me try to reload your images here. If we could get these playing, I can just scroll through them on uh, Google Drive and hopefully that should, that should work here. Okay. All right, can anybody see that? Yep. Yep. Sweet, all right. So I'm just gonna present my vision, how kind of my journey, my ecology journey over the last just 13, 14 years. So 
I originally got into ecology as a child. My love for nature started with orangutans and gorillas. I, I just love them, even as, as five years old. They're the thing that got me fascinated about nature. You know, even though all these other animals really were beautiful, the giraffes and ele the elephants, it was, it was really orangutans that made me feel connected to. Like these were the natural beings that I felt like I was connected to and really was my core connection to nature. Now going to college, you know, I always wanted to film, but when you got in, you started learning about ecology, you realize like there are massive problems in the world. For me, the moment that shocked me existentially from my core was learning, learning about the permafrost melting and feeling like, okay, that, that is the great, there is no other great challenge in our time. Like we must repair nature now with a lifetime or we're not going to make it. My thesis was on, it was on the Green New Deal and this was, you know, more than 11 years ago. And I just thought we, we have to start repairing nature. So I kind of started searching out ways to do that. So I was always a filmmaker. So I, 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 I thought, okay, what's the way? What's the way I could be a best service? I spent probably two years of my life kind of doing different internships and serving different organizations, nonprofits, solar nonprofits, clean energy, the Sierra Club. But I always felt like, you know what? It's only scratching the surface. I feel like there was never any serious impact directly in the ecology that a lot of these nonprofits were serving. So I started to look for something. And it was Jeff Lawton saying this video by him about greening the desert that really fascinated me and got me going because it was one of these only solutions showing that, hey, desert can be converted back into lush landscapes. And this just got my mind racing because I did not know that this was possible. I thought it was only protecting rainforests or having it have go to total destruction. Like permaculture changed my mindset of saying that it's possible to restore these landscapes. So I went to New Zealand for a year and that was my, my magical moment connected with nature. I spent a year traveling around learning about food forests and, and making stocky mushrooms and, and like being connected to nurseries and digging trenches and, like, and water capture areas for, and this is an orangutan sanctuary in Indonesia, but that really made me feel connected to the land for the first time in my whole life. <laughs> and it was kind of my, my, my awakening that was actually connected to nature. And one of, I think this, she was my, my first true mentor, Kay Baxter, was this amazing woman. She's in charge of the Kalanga Institute in New Zealand. And her mission is to protect the heritage seeds, but it's also to educate people about the importance of nutrient-dense food. And it awakened me because I had, I had health issues and learning how healthy food and high bricks nutrient-dense food could heal your gut was a true awakening. And for many people, it's the first awakening that they will have to the importance of healthy food and healthy soil and why they need to take care of nature and repair it. And so after learning from Kay, I really, you know, I had to do the PDC, had to learn about some design skills. And what was more important than that is permaculture thinking more than design kind of gave me, gave me a lens. It gives you a lens of looking at landscapes, looking at landscapes with potential instead of just what is. You can, you can kind of create, create a, a Oasis foodscape in your mind instead of just an empty land filled with nothing. And that's kind of a really good permaculture takeaway that I, I got from there. So back to the States I went looking for jobs. And I was like, okay, how do we get involved in permaculture? And I spent a year interning at a biochar company. We really learned like biochar is amazing, but it's kind of a budding industry in there. You know, I spent some time doing permaculture landscaping and I wish I kind of knew what I knew now because there are some amazing permaculture landscapers, but you kind of got to know who to work with um, to get started. So off I went, tried to wish for some new mentorship. I went to Permaculture Voices, met my mentor, really went this, one of my heroes, Willie Smith, fantastic guy. I spent a summer doing holistic grazing, an internship up in Santa Rosa. It was a blast. It was, it could also, it can, it was brutal and fun at the same time, spending 12 hours a day in the summer with cows, getting zapped by electric wire. It was, uh, it was such a good experience and I'm, I'm glad I had it. Though I wish I had a trailer and I could have spent more time there. And it was that summer that I got the chance to meet Zach and Seth and really got to find out about people who are using earthworks to repair nature, who are being coming, who are terraformers, who are, 
restoring landscapes through their relationship with water. And this really got me fascinated and make, made me feel like, okay, this is something that maybe I, I should be involved with in the way I can. So I spent the next year with Zach, I went to Montana, uh, filmed some of his fantastic projects. I, I was really grateful to have a chance to work with him. Kind of my first real earthwork project, building this natural swimming pool at him in Peoria, Illinois. And it was so wonderful meeting Kate and her family and being part of this, you know, one month project that seeing such transformation happen in just a single month. It was like that. And getting the pictures af after a few weeks was like we transformed this landscape from just grass, from like a corn wasteland to this beautiful oasis in Illinois, which is a beautiful part of. So, you know, I've had some adventures over the last few years building, uh, being a part of some of these projects. I got to help Zach up at Tubula Rasa Farms, they build it, um, helping out with ponds and filming these and being a part of his team's journey, which has been really fun to capture. I got to go to some quiet air coalition workshops and seeing how biomimicry can help restore landscapes by basically building beaver analogs and, and you know, creating landscapes that use old ancient techniques to restore wetlands. One of the greatest sites of this is Versa Land up in Illinois. This is ran by Grant Schultz and just seeing the vision for a farm that could be so different from these monocultures, grass-fed pigs, you know, chickens that roamed around on contour tree planting. It was just so beautiful being a part of that for a year and just seeing like, this is the model for what a farm should be. And it made me feel real connected to nature. So over the last few years, I really kind of discovered a niche for myself. Like, okay, where's the way I can fit in professionally with permaculture? One thing I discovered was, you know, one thing I, I did was webinars. And maybe you've been a part of these where, uh, you know, like I brought on some experts soil, water, ecology, regenerative business. And I felt like, yeah, this is, this is one way that I, I felt like I've connected to a special space within permaculture that I kind of found a niche. Another thing I started finding that and figuring out how I could help these companies use permaculture to expand their, their reach and their audience. And so that's what I did over the last three years is I helped Elaine Ingham at the Environmental Celebration Institute, and eventually we co-founded the Soil Food Web School last year. And really that was uh, an example of, of how you can use marketing to, ex to expand the reach of, of good ecological companies and, and bring abundance to them, which was great. But it was really when I discovered soil and compost, I really felt connected to something where I could uh, have an on the ground impact and start learning at a small scale. So I started composting in my backyard. Last year, I started apprenticing with Todd Harrington. I got to go to Connecticut and see his business up front, see the process of, of analyzing biology and doing compost extract testing, and tea testing. And he, he was, some of the projects we visited were, you know, 30,000 acres in Illinois. And just seeing how the small scale composting could quickly be scaled up to the 10, you know, like tens of thousands of acres was really inspiring. And it shows you, shows you that if you can get things right on a small scale, then you can hold the vision for what you can do on a larger scale. So I spent kind of a few months after One that. minute, Raleigh. We yeah, refining compost techniques. I made probably like 10 failed piles before I was able to get, hey, my biology is up to 0.45 fungal bacteria ratio. And at that moment made me feel really excited. And it was actually vermicompost was a really exciting process to be a part of because it's so forgiving and you can use that to resurrect failed compost piles. And so I encourage anyone to get the compost, like vermicompost should definitely be a part of that because it's incredible. And now what we're doing, Zach and I is in this period of extreme drought, we want to share stories from all over the world of how earthworks can repair ecology and restore the water cycle and water system. So I'm really proud to be a part of Water Stories and start this community so we can share with people the, the how of how we can restore water systems and the water cycle and train the next generation of professionals on how they can restore water landscapes. So thanks for listening to my presentation. I hope you learned something. I'm still learning 
still on this journey, but it's uh, it's good to see how far I've come and there's still so much I want to do. So thanks again. Thank you, Raleigh, for sharing. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists for sharing. I'm just blown away by each one of your guys' presentations. You each really brought something to offer. Um, and I'm just blown away with the work people are already doing and, and the direction you all are wanting to take it. Um, at this point, we're going to open it up to questions for the presenters, comments from the crowd. Um, we're a pretty small group here, you know, 40 or 50 totals. So the idea is to really be able to have some discussion around these topics with our last uh, 30 minutes remaining. Um, if you want to speak your question out loud, please raise your hand and we can call on you. And if you want to enter it in, please enter it into the question and answer box and indicate who the question is for. Um, so let's start out with Thomas. I know you already answered some of the questions in the chat, which is great, um, but might as well repeat them here. Uh, three different questions for you. One was uh, what you were using to clean up the water, uh, the suspended clay in the water. Um, another is asking the approximate money investments uh, in the water works that you did. And then there was another asking, I believe, how you improve the biological quality of the soils. Do you want to speak to those? Yes. So uh, it was gypsum that um, um, calcium sulfide, I guess, um, that helped to flocculate the, uh, or change the, 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 the uh, electricity or the, uh, the the charge in the water um, and uh, 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 flocculated the, the all the clay out um, uh, uh, and uh, it's interesting uh, yet uh, that is going to happen now in the uh, in the springtime uh, that's coming up uh, October um, where I'll, I hopefully can um, uh, do that, that same story again. Um, then there was this question with uh, the soil biology. Uh, yeah, so we always start with plants, I guess. We, um, uh, if we have a, a great variety on top, we'll have a, a wonderful variety. Uh, of um, root spaces and microbes below. So um, that's always our first prize. And then we have a wonderful herd of uh, Nguni indigenous um, cattle, um, a herd that we're, we're building up um, and they do fantastic work on in the grassland. It is a grass biome. So uh, the grass biome needs grazers. Uh, it was interesting actually when we first got there, uh, it hadn't had uh, large grazes for over 15 years and the grassland actually that was part of the, the erosion problem as well, um, that uh, the, the grassland degraded. So the, the grassland needs grazes, so they help of course as well in creating a, um, a better soil biome. Um, and then the cost, yeah, I guess that's a little bit difficult because uh, it will be different uh, um, in uh, where, wherever you are in the world. For us, it costs probably about three dollars a, a running meter uh, for the swale um, uh, or or dam wall, um, including uh, planting. So yeah, it, it, I guess it's uh, it's something that one has to work out in one's own backyard. Awesome. And then there was one just clarification question are you adding the gypsum every year or was that a one-time thing how often do you add it no it was just a once-off and uh, i mean we have uh, since had of course a lot uh, we had a, a, an incredible rainy year uh, this past year a rainy season so a lot of through flow from the mountains and from the overland flow and 
yeah, it it um, it brings in a lot of silt and and clay again. Uh, but yeah, within days it just flocculates out and it's crystal clear again. It's quite uh, wonderful. Awesome! Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, one of it was great seeing the seeing how the swales just resurrecting the land in that presentation. It's really really cool visually how you were able to track that. That's so important for showing the world uh, what you've done, and you've done a great job of, of showing practical examples and, and tracking the work. So huge kudos for doing that. Thank you. Well, there, there, there's a there's some interesting anecdotes that came can come out. Of course, uh, we we live in an, an area that's quite poor. Well, there's these discrepancies, like uh, you you know, I guess, um, of uh, of very poor uh, people, and then uh, the mostly uh, white uh, large scale uh, chemical farmers. And uh, we don't have a tractor on the farm. Um, we just, we have animals and we have a small two wheel tractor, but uh, um, we mainly um, uh, let uh, biology work. And um, so the, um, you know, the, the surrounding community basically, they just could not understand why we would uh, spend a lot of money in creating these ditches. Um, and, till uh, the first winter, which is our dry season, these uh, berms uh, were so full with, um, uh, with greens. And it, it's, a, it's a, a, a big pastime here, or, or a lot of, there's a lot of uh, foraging happening for small um, uh, spinaches, they call it. Uh, so it is amaranths and uh, 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 other forbs that uh, people collect and make um, a, a meal from. And in all the dry area all around, there was nothing, but of course on, on the swales and uh, on the, rather on the berms below the swales that was green and full was these, um, uh, these delicious um, meals. Um, and suddenly it became apparent why we are so crazy and uh, create these um, uh, these nonsensical ditches on the on the, on the contour yes yeah, so and yeah so we have these uh, wonderful um, experiences I guess with our surrounding communities in trying to um, bring across of what um, you know how one can work a little bit more in tune with um, uh, nature and 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 uh, the, the the elements around uh, it's awesome to hear that the, the people in the region are really seeing the value of it yeah it's, it's so oftentimes the story too oh these crazy people saying and then uh, you see the results and in a really hard time the landscape does much better um so yes. that's that's really must be rewarding for you as well i imagine yes yeah, indeed, our cows are fat after the dry winter, whereas on the, on the neighboring farms, there are the skeletons walking around because there's no grazing. So yeah, that's, that's also slowly these things are changing because what people see, you know. Mm -hmm. Nice. I got a question for Kath real quick before. You should get some sleep. It's way too, way too late over there, but what do you think was the community glue that kept these eco villages together for so long. Like the 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 most successful eco villages you were part of. Like what was the thing that helped keep them together for so long? Yeah, I would just add to that and the challenges. What was the glue and what was the challenges? Yeah. Uh, really good question. Look, personally, I think the forest is the glue. I see the people that are struggling around me and they still go out and they still work in the forest. They might do it on their own now, but the forest is, so I kind of feel like the forest is healing them. Um, the glue, hmm. I think the glue is, yeah, the glue is the forest, but the challenges are, you know, it's working. I, I just think our society is not, 
we're not designed to know how to work with each other. You know, when everything's going really well, we're fine. But when we hit challenges, we freak out and we want to run away. You know, we don't want to live through it. I remember that one of the first challenges was when the people that set this place up, you know, split up and, and it was like how we handled that made me realize that living through and facing those challenges and getting to the other side was the glue the glue wasn't the good times the glue was actually surviving the bad times so yeah maybe that answers your questions i'm back in bed <laughs> that's a good answer right there well, yeah and hey it's um it it's David Holmgren is the one of the designers of where I live. So he mm. was like kind of one of the people that created permaculture. So yeah, there you go. Nice. Awesome. Joshua, I know someone asked um, if you could type in the name of that book. I wonder if you could just mention it here on the channel for everyone. Cause that certainly piqued my interest as well. That, that book that you read that got you into reading. Nature. I can, I can share, I can share the screen. Or yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that would be great. Well, sorry. It's, um, Oh, I'll get back to this to it. Cause it's, I can't type some of my cues got wet and then I they... so loved your presentation, Josh. Oh, thank you. Are you, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. we can. So I, can you see my screen? Wait, no. Oh, share screen. We see your video, but share yeah. screen. Whoops. Is this is go. this the book you're missing? Okay. Can you see the name Oh my god, there's letters missing from it. That's so weird. Um okay, well <laughs> hold on. Let me try sharing it from my screen and then see what can I start screen sharing. Yeah, maybe maybe on your screen. I, I think because I, I converted it from a PDF to a PowerPoint, it like squished the images a little bit. So maybe that's technology trying to thwart, thwart all of us. Okay, yeah. just P-E-R-E-L-A-N-D-R-A. -E What's the name? P-E-R-E-L-A-N-D-R-A, -E Paralandra Garden Workbook. Okay. And I'm just typing that into the chat oh, too yeah. for people here. Same thing. Sweet. Okay. Excellent. Paul, we've got a question for you uh, in Northern California. In regards to your building ponds, do you have to get a permit and authorization with the state water board? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, it's a count, usually a county by county regulation thing. So for us, we are allowed up to a certain size pond for agricultural use um, without a permit. And then once you go above that, um, then you have to get a permit. So we, of course, my tactic is always to uh, have smaller ponds, if possible, move water around and to avoid any unnecessary government intervention or visits uh, as things can, someone will suddenly tell you, oh, well, you know, you can't, can't do that or you need a permit for this that you you need it's already there or something you know so but uh but that's that's what i know um for us in our county is that small ponds are the are allowable because we're uh, this in yuba which is on the edge of uh right on the edge of the sierra foothills we're still very agricultural in that particular county uh and so uh people are very active in knowing where the water goes because so much water is diverted from the river, especially for rice farming in that area. Um, an enormous amount of water, actually. Um, so people are very involved in it's in the that are in the foothills and what's going on with that water. Yeah, and on that note, someone here asked about. Um, irrigation in the western slope of the Rockies in Colorado. The ditch companies are looking to get federal funding to pipe irrigation ditches, some of which have been in operation for over 100 years. Uh, I think we're drying out our watershed and this might accelerate it. Absolutely, we are drying out our watershed. 
absolutely this might accelerate or it will accelerate it and i think the easiest thing <laughs> to think about is and Nanette brought this up as well, you know, treating the groundwater as a piggy bank. And if we're always taking out and never putting in, that's going to go very poorly. And what we have right now with these irrigation systems is we're taking water from up high and we're sending it down low very quickly to bring it into different uses. So rather than letting that water move through its natural water course, where it would slowly infiltrate into the landscape the whole way, we've sent in ditches very quickly downhill to service certain areas which then those areas use the water and pass it quickly downhill again so we're adding a lot of speed to the way that the water is moving through the ground now that's one thing in an irrigation ditch pipe that and you're even separating it from the landscape even more because there's now no evaporation into the small water cycle there's no infiltration into the landscape however small with that ditch um, so yeah, absolutely. That can increase and exacerbate these issues that we have going on. Cool. So Nanette, she had a question for you, Zach, and I, I have a little answer for this. That's, that's a good one though. So Nanette, say, Nanette says, any suggestions for an approach someone like me can take not having any guidance or financial resources to restore this wetland? situation in the middle of a suburbia. A big problem seems to be how to formally delineate the wetland area where a lot of it has been encroached upon and also when it is supposed to be seasonal. It makes defining the borders of the wetland even more contentious. Where do we even start? Yeah, that's a it's a really big common challenge. It's and it's hard to answer because when we've developed cities on top of wetlands, really the most logical and natural solution is to remove the city. Now, you're not going to be able to remove that much of a density. Uh, it's going to come with a lot of resistance. And so it's not necessarily the approach that I would advocate for. So I would approach it from an understanding of we're never going to get to the point where it was, where we have all of these wetlands reconnected with the landscape. So how do we get as close to that as we can? How can we approximate a neutral approach? So one thing I would look at is actually ways to infiltrate water higher up in the landscape. Because what you undoubtedly have going on is you have the water moving from up high in that kind of basin you described. Uh, or amphitheater, then it's very quickly moving through all of that development as soon as it hits there, then it's surging into that wetland and moving quickly out. So if you can infiltrate water even above that development, it may end up causing some issues for that development as far as water moving through the ground long term, but it's also going to even out the ephemeral flows in the wetland. Um, so looking at basically areas that are forgotten, unused, in the margins, in the ditches, where we can hold even more water than was held historically in those regions to offset the impact of the urban development. Um, I think also really making people aware of A, their impact on the wetlands and B, the value of the wetlands, um, both for stormwater surges from the ocean uh, but then also all the habitat it provides. People have to value it to understand to protect it. So I would take very much a two-pronged approach. One prong would be centered around education, getting people out into the wetlands. If you think even something like a trail through the wetlands so that people started visiting it every day could really make a long-term impact in how people are going to protect that. Um, and then if you're able to also at the same time create some infiltration for water uphill of this area, you can then start to establish more health in that system. Sounds good. I, I know in, in Richmond and Sonoma County, some of the folks that were interested in water cycle restoration, you know, they were kind of like stuck in the suburb. They thought, okay, what can I do? I'm in the suburb. Uh, I don't have land. I'm not a professional. I'm like, you know, I'm 60, but they started a few nonprofits that, that would look lobby their local community to build stormwater capture and to build water capture like swales in areas where the county controlled. And so after a year, they organized like these work parties where they did successfully build, you know, dozens of these water capture projects, you know, like half kilometer 
swales and in ditch areas where they couldn't infiltrate water. So it's like nonprofits in a suburb can have an impact on, on water capture, usually by working with the county in areas where they just don't care about. And th that's always a cool story that, that got to me because I feel like a lot of us feel stuck, especially when we're in the city or in the suburb and we want to have an impact and we don't have the land. So thanks for sharing that story, Matt. Co, you have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and contribute? Yes, it's K-O. Yeah. K-O, sorry. My apologies. So, yeah, your project unit is so exciting. And I, I think that um, um, at this point, it looks like it's a negative example, but sometimes that's even more powerful because you can show what's being lost. And you know, and and I I really think the 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 people who live in those houses and their children their children can teach their parents not to use toxic pesticides and fertilizers. The children will um, inspire their parents to uh, do gray water uh, um, drainage and getting people out walking in the in the in the area is just so powerful and. I think after COVID, people will want to work with their neighbors. They will want to work with nature. And uh, I think you're at the right place at the right time and with the right uh, challenge for people to help you with. Yeah, but I just think this is so awesome. great. Totally Seeing agree. everybody's examples was, that's the best part of this. Everyone has a story, everyone has a unique approach and everyone has a really unique expertise. And so it's it's, that has been really inspiring seeing what everybody's dealing with and they're different in a different context in different areas. Australia, South Africa, California, New England. It's it's phenomenal. So I, I really appreciate everybody sharing their stories. Paul, you've got your hand raised. Do you wanna sure yeah, do not to not to belabor the point about uh getting people on board, but uh, I think the great thing about Kath's presentation is that focus on community and those of us that are lucky enough to have land. Um, uh, well, it's not even my land, right? It's the, it's actually the, the Senan land originally. Um, but um, we realize how, you know, the idea of raising the barn with community and having people to help uh, is so critical, uh, especially because it's so easy to get overwhelmed. Um, and just one short story about that is that changing people's minds and like you said, Zach, getting them out into nature and as Riley pointed out as well, is so important. Um, my 80 year old neighbor, who's an old time rancher, like hard, hard ass, self-described redneck, um, was telling me how he's going to start making biochar like a couple weeks ago. So it's amazing like what you can, what people will do when they see good results. You know, when they see things starting to work and come together, they, they will, their whole paradigm shift will, will have this happens in their brain, even at that stage of their lives. So it's, it takes some perseverance and patience for sure, because we're dealing with a lot of fear and denial. Um, within culture around climate change and um, simplistic reduction solutions. But that's why, you know, we're all here, you know, we're on the ground to, trying to get this thing off. So that's it. Yeah. And we're in, a, we're in an emergency water situation worldwide too. So we're all, we all have to deal with this now. There's no getting around it. Uh, Jen, yeah, uh, so do I. Oh, go ahead, Zach. Uh, just we're all in this leaky canoe together and we've got to start paddling and I think this is an incredible bridge issue. If we bring it up in a way that doesn't have triggering language, whether it's religious belief triggering language, political belief triggering language, if we keep things at the core elements that are at stake here, I find regardless of who I'm speaking to, they value water, they want their children to have water, they value a healthy environment. Um, and so it's a really easy way to bridge to people who might have 
different belief systems or approaches, but we're all in it together when it comes to water and the health of the planet. I think we're all at the point where that old line, you don't miss the water till the well runs dry, is uh, yep. kind of point across to everyone. It's starting, exactly. And on that point, Joshua, you asked, do I think New England is in the early stages of desertification? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think it's actually, I would even say in the mid stages because it's such a humid, non-brittle environment. It's been whacked down so, so many times, but because of its location with the Great Lakes and with the oceans and with everything, the rain keeps coming, but we keep trying to break that cycle. Um, and we're starting to become a little bit more effective at it. So in places like in New England, where you would never have long droughts, irrigation is not even a thing. Now you're starting to have longer droughts and you're having bigger storms when it's happening. And I'm really seeing it all around the world, whether you're in the cloud forest in Ecuador or in New England or in some of these really dry places like Australia, um, you're seeing the same patterns of less regularity with precipitation and all of the stress that causes throughout the ecosystem. Yeah. Three out of the six places I backpacked in the last year and a half just burned down. It's crazy. It's like Calistoga went on flame after that. Ventana Wilderness is in flame right now. Paradise, I was there like three weeks before that burned. It's just these things happen so fast. I think part of it is, is people who aren't in the landscape interacting with it are, are kind of putting it at risk. Like you, we have to become part of the landscape and we have to interact with it. So uh, let's see. Oh, my Jen's gone. I was going to see if anybody else wanted to like pipe in who's a part of the attendees. I would extend that too to say that anyway. the people who aren't Yeah, I think the people who aren't on board yet just haven't been brought on board in a good, healthy way um, where we've really tried to consider where they're coming from. And so I think that's a really good challenge for us all to take. You know, if someone's opposed to this, are we presenting it in a good way that they can understand it? Not that we understand it, but that they, from their position of understanding, can understand it. Um, and I think when we engage in communication that way, it's really easy to find shared values around these issues. And I would also add, you know, from a community perspective, um, it's always worth thinking, actually, maybe someone else knows more than I do and actually really approaching it with that attitude because I know here we make much better decisions when we listen to everybody. Everybody's important, even those people that you think are, you know, the rednecks or whatever. It's, there's something there and it's worth hearing it because, you know, we're, we're all a part of this planet. We're all human beings on this planet, which we are a part of, so. That's a great point, absolutely. Yeah, nice. I just have to say, um, one of the lines that um, this fella in the middle of Australia says, he says, we aren't Australian, we are Australia. So I guess, you know, whatever place we're coming from, that's where we are. You know, we're actually a part of it. We're not an Australian. I am Australia. Kind of weird way of thinking about it. But it's very, I was just thinking, I mean, it, it would be good to come up with a phrase among people that's something like uh, as powerful as uh, think globally, act locally was. But specifically um, targeted uh, to water and soil. What would that One be? One thing that I heard Nicole Masters say recently is, uh, you know, in in the U.S., we call an area of hydrology a watershed. In New Zealand, they call it a water catchment. And what we're doing is shedding all of the water away. And what we need to do is catch all of the water. So if we just change our mind from water sheds to water catchments, I don't know that that's the one, KO, no, but I think that is. starts to touch at it. it. It is. We have to reframe the language. And that's brilliant. I somehow, I, I just never saw heard that before, but it's brilliant. Yeah, I hadn't till a couple of days ago. And yeah absolutely agree it's just such a simple change in wording but it changes the approach to our whole landscape 
Like Nicole and Brock, Nicole Masters and Brock Dolan are really good wordsmiths for, for ecology messaging. Dude, I was trying to unmute Jen, but well, I guess we'll just keep questions on the chat box instead of unmuting people. Oh. All right. Yeah, if someone uh, has their hand raised too, you could unmute. Well, these, or, yeah, if you can't Paul and, and KO had their hands raised. Okay. I think I'm not I'm exactly. I made you the host, so you could unmute. Like if any any uh, anybody who's who's hanging out here with us wants to be unmuted, Jen wants to be unmuted. Yeah, so Zach, Jen, you do that. There yep. we go. I just yep. I think we should be able to hear you now, Jen. If you speak, I'm speaking. There yep. We go. Awesome. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm in Japan at the moment. Um, thank you, nice. Zach. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, everyone who presented. Um, yeah, the the Nordic uh, wetlands definitely struck home as I grew up in that Fishhook Valley. I went to Fishhook High School, and it's definitely it's like my home. I miss it so much, and the ocean. Uh, what I was going to say was, um, I think, like, I believe food and then gardening is... Uh, a great sort of introduction to the whole water cycle and everything. I'm actually currently doing my permaculture design course online. And so when people, when you get people thinking about the food they eat and how it's very much connected to the earth and how important water is, it all sort of like comes together. Anyway, that's just sort of what I wanted to say, as well as um, there's a, uh, informal settlement called uh, Masipumalele or Site 5, uh, which um, Nanette mentioned is on like the edge of the wetlands. And I've been there and I've got friends who live there. And uh, yeah, there's like very little running water or um, waste management with both like garbage as well as uh, human waste. So I would definitely think like gray water systems so that people can shower and then also uh, like compost toilets or something would be great to look at. Um, there's also uh, these people, the green gorillas, who are doing like a vegetable garden type thing in Masipu Malele at the high school, I believe. Please check that out. Thank you. Uh, and I totally agree. I think. Uh, it's a great way to start to understand water and the landscape and how it uses it, it as far as food, but also it's a great way to connect to nature, you know, a minimum of one to three times per day for most people, we're connecting to nature in the food that we consume. And so that's a, it's a really good place to start the food we're eating and the water we're drinking. How are we being intentional about both of those things? How are those things being sourced? Because that ultimately impacts our health to a great deal. Nice. Well, I reckon there's one more question by Carl. I feel like we can ceremoniously close this out. Uh, and Thomas, well, I guess he had a quick question, Jen, if he's Sine's son. But Carl's saying, any thoughts about the need for a circular economy? Anyone have any input on that? Sounds pretty pretty needed to me. Like we're just throwing out all our trash to the ocean right now. <laughs> Anything's better than that. Yes. Oh, okay. So I was, I was thinking maybe you're talking about water circular i mean here we mm. we we use all our own water we collect all our own water that's what we drink we have compost toilets um and we collect water in the landscape for the gardens but i mean we've got 300 acres for you know maybe 10 10 families so that's a lot of land um in a very dry climate so you know i don't know how circular that is it sounds kind of like the wealthy having a bit of having enough water. But um, yeah, is that what you mean when you say circular economy? In terms of economy, like when I, when I hear that word, I think one place I've seen that is similar to that. You know, when you go to like Eco Village, it is way more circular, like Huang Institute. Like they're, they're collecting, they're composting their own waste. They're collecting all the bottles for recycling. They're like 
even the trash was turned into bottle bricks. So they were trying to close all of those loops. And one large place I've seen that's getting close to that was this, this place called Dominher in Italy. And they were trying, like they're minting their own currency. It was like you go to Dominher and you exchange for euros for tokens, <laughs> which, is, which is a trip, but everyone's kind of has their, their stake in the expansion of this eco village there. And for them, it was through the creation of art and kind of like this spiritual center. You know, whether you believed in what they're talking about or not, it was still a really cool example of, of a whole community like growing and expanding outwards and um, kind of becoming a closed loop, closed loop economy uh, as part of like, you know, generating their own regional economy, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah, and I think that speaks to something really broad as well, that our economic system has become so estranged from our natural system and the way, you know, the founding of Ecos is home. And we no longer have a home-centered economy. We have an economy centered around extraction of different resources and international and global trade. And I do think we need to bring it back to the economy of home, the economy of place. What is this place producing for me? How can I steward what this place produces for me? And if you can tend the economy of your own landscape, you're gonna be really well set up for the future. Uh, there's so many ways that the natural economy and our financial economy are totally in opposition. For example, with water, the natural economy flourishes with an abundance of water everywhere. The financial economy with regards to water, with water short, really small amounts of water that have to be sold and divvied up. And then a few people make really good money. Um, so I think we do need very much to move towards a more natural based economy where we're basing the wealth and value that we have on the health and vitality of the landscape we're living in. I think we should yeah. um, probably use this as a good point to wrap up, Raleigh, yeah. just to be respectful okay. of everyone's time. Well, Thanks for all of the speakers. I'm just blown away by all the things you guys are doing. Thanks for being part of Water Stories. Thanks for sharing your stories here comfortable if we chop this video up and, and share it with other people so that people can continue to see your projects and get excited and give feedback and help um, and it's just such a, a rewarding experience for us to put so much time and energy into this platform we have a lot of exciting things coming but then to have you guys return that time and energy and really put together some awesome presentations and uh, you know, wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning to come <laughs> yeah. join us. Um, so really just so much gratitude to everyone who's here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, you know, So early, uh -huh. going to bed so late. And we'll, this is just the first of many kind of community events that we want to do. You know, we're going to have more Pecha Cooches, more kind of just hangout sessions with everybody. And eventually, finally, you know, like workshops where people can come and learn from Zach. And of course, courses, we're gonna have some of those come up in the future. So thanks for being part of the first Fetch Cooch, everybody. It's, it's great seeing all your faces and I can't wait to see all your faces even more. So we're gonna close this out and just wish you all have a fantastic day. Peace, everybody. Thank you oh, very we'll much. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. We'll post this on there. Bye, everybody.